All right, Paleo Hackers, welcome back. Another episode of the Paleo Hacks video podcast. Of course, PaleoHacks.com is the place to be. I'm your host, Clark, and with me on the other end, we got John Durant. John, thanks for coming on the show, man. Thanks for having me on. We were joking before that you got the little uh, air traffic controller microphone set up. I, yeah. I like it, man. I, I think of it as my Madonna head. Madonna head. It's, it's very glamorous, and it allows me to dance and move. Right yeah, I need one of those instead of this big, <laughs> big honker right here. Yeah. So, John, you were on episode... 10 I think it was it was it was like three years ago um, uh, yeah three years ago it was when your book came out yep I got yeah, it yeah yeah go for it well I, I mean back then I was you know living living paleo in New York and I guess the biggest change since then is I'm, I'm getting ready to leave New York oh. um, and then it's been it's been interesting to see how yeah you know New York has um, in a funny way, it's the most stereotypically caveman existence because you're living in a concrete, tiny room sure. uh, for most of the time. But in in reality, and, and a lot of people there care about food, but boy, is it hard to get outside. It's hard to play sports. It's hard to have a dog or something like that. And at a certain point for my own sanity, I, I picked up and decided to move. Okay. You know, I'm not sure I know your your story of kind of how you got into that lifestyle. Um, I, don't, I don't know if we went in on it on call 10 or I know we got a lot of new listeners since then. So how I'm, I'm just curious, how did you get into living uh, the caveman lifestyle? I, if you go all the way back, I, I studied some evolutionary psychology in college. Um, I, I got to work with a, a great professor and writer named Steve Pinker, who's written a lot on the subject. Um, I, I, I wasn't focused on health or fitness. I was looking at economic history and, and trade in relation to sort of our evolutionary past. Um, but then when I got out of school, moved to New York and, and just felt terrible working a desk job and knew I had to eat healthier, but, you know, didn't quite know what that meant. I uh, came across Art Devaney's website in 2005 or 2006. He was sort of an early mover, though he's become a little more quiet recently. Um, gave it, gave it a shot. Walked into my first CrossFit gym, CrossFit box in uh, January of 2007. Um, started the Paleo Meetup group in New York. Was involved in some media in 2010. There was a New York Times piece that helped sort of kick off the current wave of, of media attention and a Colbert interview, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and then I quit my job, wrote the book, and the book came out a couple years ago. Awesome, man. And and that was about three years ago, correct? Uh, it was about two. It was it was a little over two. So I know um, I know as creative people, you're always a bit of a perfectionist inside of you. So I'm sure that three year period between when you wrote the book and uh, two years where it is now, there's some things you wish you could have added in or taken out. I mean, what kind of modifications would you make today to the Paleo Manifesto? You know. I I, um, I I don't want this to come off in the wrong way, but I'm actually really happy with how it's held up. And, and there hasn't been a part of it <clears throat> where some new study has come out that completely overturned a chapter or a paragraph or anything like that. What I, I, I probably would have emphasized a few things more. I probably would have emphasized the, I mentioned the microbiome, the gut microbiome. Mm-hmm. I think I would have mentioned it a little bit more. Um, and, and gone deeper into into its role in our health, our mental health, our digestion, um, and uh, and and I, but but other than that, I was, I'm I'm actually pretty happy with how it's held up. Okay, well that, that's good then. I mean, it's it's good to yeah. have timeless stuff, and especially if you're writing about ancient things. Yeah, and, and part of the goal was. <clears throat> I didn't want to take a stand on really on minutia that could be overturned by a single study. So, so when I set out to write the book, I, I really sp- set out with the explicit goal of making this book last five years from now, ten years from now, so on. Yeah, and so I'm sure you get a lot of people who come up to you and say, you know, John, I read your book, and now I'm I'm starting to get into that lifestyle. I'm starting to 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 live it and eat healthier and and get better. What's some of the most like common feedback you get? Do a lot of people is this their first book they go to when they're trying to get into adopting a paleo lifestyle or what are some common feedback that you get from like readers? 
Uh, one one common piece of feedback is that people expect it to be dogmatic and sort of ideological and rigid, and then they get into the book and realize that it's savvier and more sophisticated and frankly more entertaining entertaining than they than they thought it would. Because if you take the title Paleo Manifesto, it sounds like a strong statement of an ideology. Yeah. Um, a, a second thing that people find is. You know, there's a reason that the word diet isn't on the cover of the book, and and that was a very deliberate choice. In fact, in my first meetings with with the big publishers in New York, I said the word diet will not appear on the cover of my book, and if if that is a problem for you, then we're not the right fit. This isn't the book for you. Um, why didn't so, you Why didn't you want diet on there? Well, I, I even even though a lot of people are you know looking for weight loss solutions and things like that. Um, I, I don't I don't like the word diet. I, I don't like the sort of how it's become bastardized and this emphasis on short term weight loss rather than a sustainable way of eating on an ongoing basis for the rest of your life. Sure. Okay. And, and, I, and I talked about a lot more than food. Um, so, you, you know, a lot of these books will say it's a lifestyle, but they're st- they'll still spend 80 percent of their time on food. Um, and, and I ha- had, uh, you know, a broader set of topics. The lifestyle part of uh, paleo or any other sort of lifestyle diet really fascinates me. Kind of the things you can do outside of the three, four, five times a day you're eating food that really make a, a bigger health impact. Like we're talking about clean water, we're talking about sleep, we're talking about movement, talking about products, you know, all that sort of stuff, uh, the lifestyle component. So I kind of want to touch on that uh, a little bit because I think it's important that doesn't come up on this call. What are some of your go-to like fundamental lifestyle uh, hacks, if you will, that you incorporate into the paleo lifestyle? Yeah, I mean, I've um, I've paid I've started to pay more attention to microbiome in my daily life. Um, I. There's a there's a spray that I use that that has actual live good bacteria on it to help replenish uh, your skin microbiome. Um, it's called Mother Dirt. Um, if you go there, I'm I, I actually am helping the company as well. Um, in in terms of gut microbiome, you know kombucha, other fermented foods. Um, you know, one of the things that I found is incredibly important is just you know, your, your social network and who's in sort of your immediate circle. Um, I was living with some folks in New York who for, for almost a couple of years who were great people, but none of them were really into food. None of them were into health and fitness. And that has a profound effect on the decisions you make. Yeah. Um, and, and so people spend all this time struggling with discipline. I'm going to change myself. You know, I'm going to be n- new year, new, new you sort of, type of thing. And, but if you surround yourself with the same people who have the same habits, um, that you had before, it's very difficult to change yourself. So, um, I've, I actually have paid a lot of attention to sort of, uh, the, the people I surround myself with. Okay. So we got some microbiome in there and we got who you surround yourself with two very important things to dive into. Um, I think the microbiome is kind of its own its own beast. We'll tackle in a bit, but the the who you who you hang around is very important because that's one of the biggest pieces of feedback I get on this show from uh, from moms actually that it's hard con- converting or bringing over their family to adopt their lifestyle that they want to do if they're if they're cooking for more people. You know, sometimes they just want the the cocoa puffs or, or whatever, and it's hard to really adapt that. Um, for the moms listening out there, just to address that piece, do you have any sort of ways or hacks or, or advice for maybe getting people in your immediate circle to transition or at least be open to a, another way of, of eating? Well, I mean, one thing to do is try to make it easy for other people. What, what's been good about the paleo movement over the last few years is you've had more um, – You've had more figures springing up with great recipes or companies springing up with meal delivery services or, um, you know, better tasting products. And and so so to some extent, I I do think there's sort of like a a little of a backdoor method where 
um, you start to serve people stuff that just tastes good and, uh, and, and they don't really notice that you don't try to convert them. You just give them, you know, a good, a good tasting option. Um, that, that's a big part of it. I mean, another thing is when I speak with people, I don't try to persuade them necessarily of the truth of paleo as a whole. I'll, I'll typically focus on, I'll, I'll try to find if there's a specific functional issue that people have. Maybe it's a, a digestive problem or skin or something like that. And, and, and really try to speak directly to those benefits. Because I, I tell you, the, the other piece of feedback, you know, uh, people ask me, is paleo a fad, right? Is, is it going to be popular for a few years and fade away? And I'm actually working on a post, something like 16 reasons why paleo isn't a fad. But, but one of them is that there's a whole host of issues that people have, conditions that people have, that they don't talk about at cocktail parties. No, nobody's nobody's at a cocktail party saying, "Hey, let me tell you about my IBS and you know and and the you know the runny poops that I have." Um, and but if you solve some of those really important problems that people don't talk about for people, um, they don't go back. And 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 they don't. It doesn't matter whether you buy into the ideology or the framework or the world view. If you've had to stay within 50 yards of a toilet for you know, for your adult life, and now you don't have to anymore. That's incredibly powerful, and and that affects all different types of people. Sure, and I think too, people get burnt out hearing about the weight loss promises, and and when you're able to kind of put a new incentive in their minds of maybe you don't have to stay within fifty feet of a bathroom for your whole adult life anymore. That's not normal. Yeah. Then, then they're able to grab onto that and go for it. So getting getting clear on the why is a common trend we hear or, over and over again. Or for kids, take for kids. So I, I went back to my high school and gave gave a talk to uh, to the to the high school students, mm-hmm. and I focused on acne and and, and dental health as well, braces, yeah. things like that, because those those are really relevant challenges. And I I mean I remember I I didn't have terrible acne, but it was enough to to bother me and you know, to make me less confident and and things like that. Um, Poor skin quality can be absolutely devastating to the social lives of of kids. And, you know, they get put on these antibiotics um, and, you know, that that can cause other issues. Um, And so if you can put yourself in the shoes of the other person and say, oh, here's something you've already wanted to address or that's negative in your life and here's how this can help. Yeah, that's great, man. Uh, meeting someone with where they're at with what really matters to them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Don't just go to someone and say, hey, your diabetes numbers will be lower and, and your blood cholesterol levels are going to improve. But saying, hey, man, your acne is going to improve and your energy levels and kind of uh, marketing towards them for, for, for why they should go about adopting a lifestyle. Right, because because not everybody. The reality is, is not everybody is going to want to identify with paleo, or not everybody's going to want to call themselves a caveman or cave woman or whatever. And that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Um. You know, but y- you can you can reach people where they are, as you said. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's one thing I I go through is I love this style of eating and this lifestyle. Uh, with a passion, I feel way better on it. I thrive on it, but I still kind of get a little. Oh God, here we go again. When I, when people ask me about what diet I'm following or what nutritional approach I'm following, you know, and if I say paleo, you just get the same 10 questions over and over and over again. And when one of them you touched on with, Oh, it's a fad. Right. But I think there's definitely a difference between a fad and a trend. You know, one is more, the, the fad is very spikes. It's, it's the wave. And the oh, and the the trend is like the tide. It's very strong, but it's still going to be there. I like I like your metaphors, uh, and I and I completely agree. The, the there are all sorts of reasons. You know, people will say, you know, is gluten a fad? You know, right. is paleo a fad? I I actually have have a belief that at some point, I, I I don't think the emphasis on gluten is necessarily misplaced, but gluten gets much more attention than some of the other things in grains. Yeah. And, and I actually think there will come a time when, um, when gluten, uh, going gluten-free may be overrated, but going grain-free is still underrated. So I, I was actually talking, I, I 
gave a paid talk to uh, to a group to a to a food company, and um, and and they thought gluten free was a fad. And my perspective was moving away from wheat, corn, and soy as the basis of our diet is not a fad, and it has a long way to go. Yeah. Well, I think too. Um, we've touched on it on the show, but a lot of the people putting out this information on blogs, on news, on YouTube, there's an incentive to 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 talk about what's hot and to get the views. And there's two ways to get traffic, views, publicity. It's one on the way up to write about why something's great, why gluten and free is, is better, why uh, going paleo is better, why intermittent fasting is better, and and when it when it's hot and the ball's rolling. But then where's the other way? Once everyone knows about it, the other way to get traffic is to now bash that hot trend. Yeah. Like why this why paleo is wrong, why gluten free isn't as good. And so people are always in this flux between the pendulum swinging all left or all right and and it's it's just the wave of the internet. Yeah, and you know, I've I've seen this in in a few different arenas. Uh first of all, articles about pa- paleo get a lot of page views. Uh, because the community is large and people care about it. Um, and, and so some of these hit pieces on paleo are, yeah. they're not motivated by really trying to understand what's going on. They're motivated by page views. Um, you know, we, we've seen that in the CrossFit world. Um, I don't, I don't think that, you know, I, I, I think there are areas where, you know, there can be valid criticism of CrossFit, but there, there are a lot of media pieces that just lay into CrossFit um, from people who don't know what they're talking about. And it's, it's just a way to, uh, you know, to attack something that's succeeding. Yeah. But the haters, the haters, I was going to hate. Did you get Did you get any haters from your book or any hate mail? Um, I got a little bit of hate mail. I I recently got an email from a, a young college student who wants my book banned on her college campus, wow. and she wrote a letter. I know I was really proud of that. I was like, yeah. this, "This is I've I've arrived. I'm somebody." Um, and and basically because of my criticism of vegetarianism, and wow. she sent me the letter that she or an excerpt of the letter that she sent to her college president. And it, it wasn't, it wasn't like, uh, you know, th- this guy is, uh, w- whatever, we, we shouldn't be banning books regardless, but, um, was giving like detailed and specific rebuttals of the biochemistry of vegetarianism as if that were somehow a rationale to ban a book on campus. It was not. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, I, if you look at my Amazon reviews, um, I enjoy, I, I really enjoy reading. Um, they're, they're nearly all good, but occasion I have sort of have like a bimodal distribution. I get a lot of fours and fives and then I get some ones. Sure. And the ones are almost invariably vegetarians and vegans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who, who aren't happy with, with some of the things I've said in there. It's funny too, because, um, I'm sure you can get 50 five star reviews, 54 star reviews but like five one star reviews and it, it's weird how our mind works where our negativity sway bias kind of we go to that one star and, and we give it i i would give it more time in my mind and and get yeah. you know these these like mental loops like oh that's not true this blah, 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 versus like the five star reviews who are like you know good job man you, d- you did a good thing uh yeah, I mean, I don't, it, I don't lose sleep over it. And, and in fact, when I get a, a poorly written one star review in my head, I count it as a five star review. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, quality you know, of writing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it, 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 you, you know, we, we need a little, people should take a stand. And when you take a stand, some people are going to respond positively and some people are going to respond negatively. It is almost impossible to get a strong, positive response out of some people if some people aren't going to get upset somewhere. It's almost impossible. Because as soon as you try to make everyone happy, you make no one happy. And it's just vanilla blah. Yeah, no, for sure, man. I think that um, if you're going to say anything that needs to be said, it's going to have some sort of controversy with it. Uh, Like the, the, the what's new and cutting edge and different opinions are by nature, polarizing. You're either going to fall on one side or the other, um, sometimes in the middle. But again, that's that's that that area that's kind of blah vanilla. 
Um, well, so, and and in in the vegetarian to be a little more specific about what some people got angry about was um, th- there's actually a a little bit of a research literature on an association between mental illness and vegetarianism, hmm. um, and there are there was a pretty large study that was done in Germany a few years ago that looked at this association and tried to tease out causation. You know, maybe it's some people with some mental issues that are being attracted right. to uh, like a res- restrictive form of eating, um, or, you know, maybe there are some mechanisms by which it can be caused. And I, di- you know, I discussed this in a, in a sort of a reasonable and, um, uninflammatory tone of voice. I mean, this is a peer reviewed science. Wait, I'm sorry. Um, so the, the study linked vegetarianism and, uh, mental disorders together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's not the only one to do so. Well, from pragmatic uh, data, I know I I could I could see where they'd get. Well, that. well, and and here's what part of what I think is going on is that there there could be like a um um a, a, a like an obsessive compulsive disorder mm-hmm. um and when you combine that with a heightened disgust reflex, so disgust think of disgust as a um an intuitive microbiology. It helps keep us away from things that could potentially infect us. So rotten stuff, bodily fluids, corpses, uh, you know, rodents, insects, things, the things that routinely gross us out, or at least when you look across cultures around the world, um, are are things that back in the day or even today um, could infect us. And the behavioral response discuss the action and behavioral response is to um, like expel something from your mouth. You sort of gag, which is the body saying, get this out of my body. And a lot of people will actually physically move away when they're disgusted and sometimes even put up their hands, which, which um, is the appropriate behavioral response to get away from something that could infect you. Um, So it's, it's biologically wired. Correct. There, and, and it can be modified by culture and upbringing. Obviously, when it comes to foods, you know, Americans love cheese. The Chinese think it's disgusting. You know, the yeah. Koreans love kimchi and whatever else. So, um, so obviously, it, it, it can be altered. But there's, there's actually a quite extensive literature looking at um, the function of disgust as, as this intuitive microbiology. That's um, fascinating, man. Well, and, and so here's how it intersects with vegetarianism. So meat spoils faster than plants. Meat is actually, if you live in an era before refrigeration, um, it, it's easier, even though meat has more nutrients, it's more energy dense, you know, high protein, high quality protein, it's still, um, a, a, you can get pathogens from it more easily than plants. Because plants have built in compounds that are basically insecticides and fungicides and things like that because plants just sort of fit still they're rooted to the ground and so they have to fight off the invaders using chemical warfare animals don't have that capability meat spoils faster and so it's a greater disease risk okay. so if if you have this really heightened disgust reflex that can get triggered by blood by body parts by corpses by, you know, you have all these vegans who talk about like meat is just rotting flesh in your colon, whatever. PETA's tactics are to gross people out. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so you can see how a, dis- how a, a super sensitive disgust reflex could get triggered by meat in a way that it couldn't, it is less likely to be triggered by plants. Now, you combine that with the fact that women tend to have a more sophisticated disgust reflex. Hmm. So, Women, you know, for much of history were either pregnant or carrying small children, and pregnant women and small children are highly susceptible to disease. And, you know, there's enormous downside risk to getting infected, during, you know, when pregnant or, you know, with a small child. So it was extremely important for women and small children, um, women and infants, to avoid something that could infect them. Um, and there's study after study showing that women, in fact, do have a stronger disgust reflex. Now, it, it, it's sometimes inappropriately called a weak stomach. And 
it's not that women have weak stomachs. As I say in my book, it's that they have discriminating taste. Um, and, and it's actually an evolved uh, mechanism to avoid something that could infect you. So now you put it all together and you say, all right, so meat is more likely to trigger disgust. Women have a more sensitive disgust reflex than men do. And then you look at all the gross out tactics that the vegetarian world uses and you can see how vegetarianism might be a, um, it, you know, it might be less of a sort of a reasoned rational choice than so much a response to the fact that we're no longer in touch with our food. We're grossed out by where it comes from and so forth. Wait, so how, do, how does the disgust tie into that again? Because I, I loved the, the component of like the weak stomach and, you know, right. spoiling more often and all that well, stuff. But that seems to be an argument like for vegetarianism, like why you wouldn't want to touch meat. Well, we'll take um, because meat isn't necessarily like the meat, uh, you know, if you get meat from a farm or if you get it from a high quality source, it's, uh-huh. it's, it's not going to infect you and you can cook it. And that, you know, that kills anything. In fact, a lot of foodborne illnesses come these days come from things like spinach and, and other other vegetables in our in our supply chain. To, to take a really extreme example of this, think of morning sickness. Right. So morning sickness is this period of a time in the first trimester of a pregnancy where women are um, grossed out, revolted by a lot of foods that they otherwise would have eaten. And meat and meat is is part of it, um, but also strong tasting food, strong odors, uh, um, coffee, some other things like that. Um, this this could basically be a period of time where the body says avoiding infection is more important, you know, during this, in, this very sensitive developmental period is more important than, um, you know, than, than the nutrients in, in meat. Um, but if, but it, vegetarians are basically doing that all the time. And that can be a recipe for disaster where, where you're not getting a high quality food source. Um, and you're avoiding things that aren't actually a risk. Okay. Okay. Does so, that make more sense? Yeah, it makes more sense. I uh, it's fascinating, fascinating stuff with the disgust reflex and kind well, of why we would avoid certain foods at certain times and how maybe that doesn't shift off for people and it's it's more prevalent throughout their life versus intermittently. Right. Or or take um, you know, take a take a fermented food that some people don't like. Take kombucha or kimchi. Not, natto, or, natto, those beans. Natto, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. If, if you eat that growing up, you get used to the taste and you think it's sort of normal and you come to enjoy it. So you, you, basically, our disgust reflex needs to be set appropriately during development. Otherwise, we can be grossed out by things that maybe aren't bad for us, that are quite good for us. So we, all these people now grow up in cities. They don't grow up on farms. They, they don't know where their food comes from. Um, they, they watch Disney movies about Bambi and sort of anthropomorphize right. uh, these animals. And so when they're in the grocery store and they see, you know, a perfectly good piece of meat, they can get grossed out by, you know, a speck of blood or, oh, my gosh, they didn't cut the feet off. And and to me, that's a that's a hypersensitive disgust reflex that's um, you know, if, if you let it run wild, it's going to cause some health problems down the road. That's fascinating, man. It seems to be, uh, there's an emotional component to, um, that gets in the way of debating the facts and logics when it comes to food and nutrition. Definitely. Oh, food is, is very religious, very, yeah. very religious yeah. and political in nature. So, so like when I was researching what you were up to in the past two years, I was watching some YouTube videos and there's one, I think you might even have a couple debates on YouTube with uh, vegans or, uh, and they want to, they want to pin the paleo guy next to the vegan. That's what everyone wants. Like why, why did they choose you? Did you set that up or is that something you're, you're passionate about or you just walk into it or how did that come about? Well, I, I had one very interesting debate with John Mackey, the CEO and founder of Whole Foods. Oh, really? Is that, <laughs> yeah. is that what I was looking at right here? The vegan versus uh, the uh, man versus vegan. What is the best diet? Um, 
Maybe. So I've done, free, I've freedom, done freedom Fest yeah, 2014. Freedom yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, that's John Mackey. Okay. Yeah. 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 So really, really great opportunity. And and he's really a wonderful person and entrepreneur. I mean. Yeah. Conscious he, Capitalism. He, great book. Yeah. And, and he, he's done a, an incredible amount of work to, you know, bring people closer to food, um, e- even if they don't eat like he does. Um, and, and so I respect him a lot for that. Um, you know, we, we had, we had some disagreements, um, on some of the substance on some of the biochemistry on nutrient density and things like that. He actually surprised me. Um, I was taken, I was caught a little bit off guard because I thought he was going to defend veganism as the optimal human diet. Mm -hmm. And he didn't, he, he, he said a small amount of meat and fish Mm. is probably optimal, but he chooses to go full vegan for that, that last part for ethical reasons. So I, I found, um, I was a little caught off guard by that. Um, you know, but, but we, we had a good debate and, uh, and I enjoyed it, but you know, people, people enjoy a certain amount of conflict. Yeah. Um, it, you know, when I post on veganism, it tends yeah. to get more page views and retweets yeah. and things like that. So, but at, at the end of the day, um, I, uh, you know, at the end of the day, maybe maybe there's sort of a yin yang dynamic, the paleo and and the plant based side of things, um, where you know we sort of bring different things to the table and uh, and are sort of different paths into the food movement. So that that's me being a little bit more conciliatory. Well, I love listening to vegans and raw foodists, especially. I love it, and, and not, <laughs> not not to say you guys are crazy and I bash them, but what can I learn from these people? Because it's totally different conversations than if you listen to like paleo podcasts or health podcasts. And to be, I don't really listen to any other podcasts. I, I get a lot through conversations like this. Um, but I will listen to like David Wolf or some other like raw foodists uh, because they're talking about weird mineral spring water and raw water and, you know, earthing and all these different things and sun gazing and all these different uh, methods and crystals that are just so out there that I find really fascinating. And uh, I love it. Yeah, it, it's, you know, you got to expose yourself to new ideas. And, and if you're listening to the to the same stuff over and over again, you know, it's it's just going to reinforce your beliefs. So it's uh, you know, it's good to it's good to get a dose of like confirmation different. bias. Yeah, yeah. So, do you think then, um, coming off that debate, was there any point that he pulled out, maybe that changed your view on a, a paleo principle or lifestyle? Not really. No. <laughs> Not really. I mean, um, I didn't. You know, I didn't. He he he. Had, there's some scale that was developed for nutrient density of sort of all the foods and whole foods. And frankly, and I said this at the time, so I'm not sort of talking behind his back, but I, I thought it was ridiculous um, where like wild salmon was down near the bottom of the list. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like th- these are incredibly nutrient dense foods that if necessary, you could survive on in the wild and you can't survive, you know, on you know, on a single plant out there in the wild. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that, that there was a breakthrough insight at the same time. I, because I wrote extensively about vegetarianism and veganism in my book, you know, I took the time to read some vegan books. I read mm-hmm. Jonathan Safran Foer's eating animals. I read thrive by brendan brazier i i read some other books on the subject so i i've i've exposed myself to it okay okay well fascinating well one thing that comes up for both sides or all diets is what we were talking about earlier which i want to touch on and that is the skin microbiome specifically um the skin because we haven't had anyone talk about the skin microbiome i know people I've come on here. I think we had like five gut shows in a row. So the audience yeah. is pretty, they know their gut floor very well and the villi and the microvilli and kind of how the process works. But we didn't have anyone talk about the skin. And I know people today, you know, in every office space, there's a Purellin and, yeah. and just, you know, wash your hands 80 times a day and soap and shampoo and soap and shampoo. So, so rant it up, John. What's, what's going on? Yeah. So, so the gut and the skin are our two, are the two largest organs of the body. And there are two largest sources of contact with the outside world, you know, through your alimentary canal, through what you eat, and then through your skin. And because it's an organ with with a lot of contact with the outside world, it's part of our immune system. 
in, in some sense, it's the first line of defense. And, and so a lot of people have realized that the, the gut plays a really important role in our immune system. When you disrupt the gut microbiome, it can trigger or set the stage for a lot of mysterious autoimmune conditions. Well, guess what? The same thing is true of the skin. Hmm. And the skin is this other area where people have these mysterious autoimmune conditions and rashes and eczema and even acne, you might say. Um, and and it's it, the conventional advice, which is anti-inflammatories and steroid creams and things like that, is really treating the symptom, not the root cause. So um, I saw, I read a wonderful article in the Times uh, maybe about a year and a half ago called um, My Soap-Free, Shampoo-Free, Bacteria-Rich Hygiene Experiment. Amazing article. Go Google it. It's great. Um, and it was about this company up in Cambridge, Massachusetts that um, had developed a, um, a live good bacteria to put on your skin to help start to replenish your gut micro or your skin microbiome. And the insight actually came from observing horses that when on a hot day, when they were sweaty, they would sometimes roll around in the mud. And the, the chief scientist was sort of wondering why they did that because uh, it seemed to have a function. And so we started to take samples of the mud to see whether there were microorganisms in there that, that might be beneficial. And uh, he, he ended up settling on this class of bacteria called ammonia oxidizing bacteria, or AOB. Um, AOBs are, look, they're, they're just like the gut. There are tons of different strains of bacteria. They interact in complicated ways. And really the end goal is an ecosystem, a healthy ecosystem that is sort of in balance. Um, uh, and, and, and not any one particular strain. But what's unique about this strain is it metabolizes ammonia. And ammonia is in our sweat. It's in our feces. Um, and uh, one of its byproducts of its metabolism is nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a really important molecule in the body. Nobel Prizes have been awarded for its discovery and, and functions. Um, its functions primarily fall into two categories. Um, it is a, um, a vasodilator. It relaxes blood vessels. And it's a signaling molecule. Um, and the, you know, the nitric oxide pathway in the body is how... Uh, a lot of hypertension drugs work uh, for, for blood pressure, relaxing blood vessels. Um, it's how <laughs> Viagra and some of these erectile dysfunction drugs work. Um, and, 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 and so it, it really has a, can potentially have a systemic effect on a lot of um, of you know potential systemic inflammation in the body. And that, that's in the chemical that was in the dirt that the horses were running in? So there was, there's a mic, there's a mic, there's a living microorganism, this class of bacteria, ammonia oxidizing bacteria. And when you put it on your skin uh -huh. and when it metabolizes the ammonia, it produces the nitric oxide. Okay. Okay. Fascinating. Yeah. So, so, um, I reached out to the company and was fascinated by it. Um, and, and, and so I, I'm actually now advising the company, but they've released a, a biome friendly, uh, they have the spray, which we call the mist, um, which I spray on myself about twice a day. What I have found really incredible is, and I'm speaking about my own results here because I don't want to get in trouble with the FDA because we're right. sort of going through that process. Um, I've had an incredible reduction in odor in my crotch and pits, basically. Um, I basically find that if I spray this on, um, you know, a few hours later, there's basically not any odor. Mm. So I'm not having to use deodorant. I'm not having to use a conventional deodorant, an alternative deodorant, at least in most cases. You know, if I'm on an airplane or if I'm on a hot subway, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll use a little something. Um, and, um, and then other people have, have just had really, uh, really incredible results. One woman had, uh, would, would get a, a big inflammatory response to mosquito bites um, and basically couldn't garden anymore because the, the inflammatory response was so strong. And she started spraying this on her body and 
she started to just get normal mosquito bites that were a, a mild nuisance. Um, so that was life changing for her. Hmm. People have had great results with eczema and rosacea and things like that. You know, we are just at the beginning of understanding the gut microbiome or the skin microbiome. Yeah. Um, but the, the same stuff that we've just seen play out in the gut, it's going to play out with the skin. It's just five or 10 years behind. Hmm. Um, cause, cause it's the same dynamics going on and just like people have a mysterious gut conditions and then they solve it, um, and, um, and, and can sometimes have life changing effects. Same thing with the skin, same thing with the skin. Organ of detoxification. It's the biggest one of, uh, of your body, correct? Yeah. Biggest, yeah. 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 Organ. You know, it's, it's yeah. how, it's how a lot of things can leave the body through sweat. Yeah. And 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 the humans are we're not unique, but we're almost unique in terms of animals that sweat so much. Um, yeah. And and it may be that we've co-evolved with this ammonia oxidizing bacteria to metabolize the ammonia in sweat. I, I mean, another area where they've had great results is with diaper rash. Mm. So the typical standard approach to diaper rash is, um, you know, so you've got a you've got a baby. You've got feces in contact with the baby's skin for too long. And the ammonia is one of the things that causes the irritation. So you mm -hmm. get redness and irritation. Now, most of the creams that are used uh, to treat uh, baby rash are, really are treating the symptom. They're trying to deal with the inflammation, not what's causing the inflammation. Of course, you, you know, you clean the baby and you get rid of the feces, but, um, and some of the folks that have been using this for diaper rash uh, have just gotten phenomenal results because this, bact this good bacteria actually metabolizes the ammonia that's on the baby's skin that's causing the irritation. Yeah. Um, so it's, 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 really, it's really neat what, what they're working on. That's cool stuff. Um, so it's kind of a step up then. Like it, it, um, so, you know, let's just say baseline sanitation is taking a synthetic soap and rubbing it all over yourself in the shower. The kind of natural approach would be maybe using like a, like a natural soap or no soap at all or no in, the soap. in the case of that experiment. But this is kind of the next level of jump. So if you're going from synthetic, it's two steps up of actually adding in good right. stuff to your skin. Yeah, I mean it's 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 a living probiotic, mm -hmm. um, just just like we've we've started to see see that with the gut. Um, but but check them out. They're um, you can go to motherdirt.com. dot com. Yeah, I was just um, looking at them. Yeah, and uh, you know if I, I if if people have some weird uh, chronic skin condition that's been bothering them for a long time, uh, no promises, but it's definitely worth a shot. Try it out and see how it goes. John Durant, man, we're out of time. This is this is fascinating, though. I love this kind of conversation. We talked about uh, crazy debates and skin <laughs> microbiome. This is the stuff I, I disgust. And, I, disgust. Yeah. I like this kind of conversation, man. It's fascinating. So uh, we got a blast. It's got to be sooner than two years uh, next time you come on the show for sure. Oh, we'll, we'll we'll definitely do it sooner. And you know, so if if people want to check out my book, there's there's more in there. The Paleo Manifesto. I I guarantee you, if, even if you've read five or six other paleo books, there's going to be new stuff in there that you're going to enjoy. I love it. It's uh, my go-to poop book, man. You sent me two copies when it came out, so I put one <laughs> by my throne, and it's been the, the go-to book I read in there for the past two years. So <laughs> very, my very familiar with it. your book. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, before I let you go, um, the best place to find you at, you sent me is Wild Ventures, Correct. Yeah, um, I, I started doing some work in venture, basically to help companies that we believe in uh, to succeed. Um, and 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 so basically, you know, there are all of these venture capitalists out there that are funding pills and pharmaceuticals and medical devices and all these things that and and the healthcare system, which is just a bureaucratic mess. And really, what I believe is going to be the most effective is effective changes in lifestyle. So, um, you know, you have to build the future that you want to see and entrepreneurs do that. So, so basically I've, I've been increasingly helping, uh, you know, founders that 
I believe in, you know, doing doing yeoman's work um, and creating the future that we want to see. Awesome, man. So another thing we got going with Paleo Hacks, we have PaleoCon, the first summit they did, um, and you host that, and it's getting relaunched, I believe. Uh, talk a little bit about PaleoCon. I know it was a while ago, but uh, oh, just give Yeah, it was a, great. Yeah. You know, we... Um, we put together a great program. I interviewed 25 plus uh, figures from Lauren Cordain to Michelle Tam to Katie the Wellness Mama to Rob Wolf. Uh, so we have a really all-star lineup. Um, we shot some great video stuff around recipes at Hugh Kitchen in New York and and um, some different some different uh, workouts as well. And uh, it, it it was a blast. It was a blast. It was it was a lot. It was sort of everybody who's anybody in space, um, with a lot of great practical tips, insights, uh, discussion of sort of like current findings and the latest studies and things like that. It's kind of your Paleo 101 course, or and, and next level as well. It's 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 the uh, the uh, I don't want to use manifesto because that's your book name, but it's, <laughs> biggest thing so paleohacks.com check out the paleo summit more information on stuff like this on uh, what we were talking about today and cool videos sounds like that's right that's right it's awesome john my man thank you for coming on the show it was a blast yeah same thanks all right man take it easy yeah you too